Well, we're here to talk about faith and belief. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of knowledge about the 23% of the globe's population that believes in Islam. Some people are pretty certain what that means. President Trump, when he was running for president on the Anderson Cooper show, said, Islam hates us. And at a subsequent TV show, he was asked, do you want to modify that at all? It's a pretty sweeping statement. And he said, no, not at all. It's a whole lot of hate out there. It's always a little feckless to ask President Trump for evidence. <laughs> but he seems to believe that the essence of Islam was expressed by the terrorists at 9-11. Well, the Gallup poll did one of its most extensive and expensive surveys of Muslims worldwide, wrote a whole book on the methodology used. And they asked, do you agree with the people who attacked America on 9-11? 7% said they agree. 23% said they didn't. And the 23% were giving religious reasons for why they're against terrorism. They quoted the Quran, whereas the 7% had mainly secular reasons, anti-Americanism, anti-colonialism, et cetera. They were hardly outstanding Muslims. They, were, they drank and had laptops on the night before the attack. And they thought that they were going to enjoy the services of 72 virgins in heaven, which is not in the Quran <laughs> or in any respectable hadith traditions. Patricia Crone, the great scholar, said, the thing about the uh, people who are carrying out terrorism attacks is that they obviously don't know their own religion. So what can we tell about their religion? Naturally, we should go to the Quran uh, and see what a creed would sound like. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew, they ask Jesus how to pray to the Father, and he gives them the Lord's Prayer. In the Quran, they ask Allah, through Muhammad, how they should pray. And here's, here's one of many creeds in the Quran. We believe in God and in what was sent down to us and what was sent down to Abraham Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes, and what was given to Moses, Jesus, and all the prophets by the Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and we devote ourselves to him in all of them. That's a very inclusive creed. Uh, the narrow definers of Judaism sometimes say that the chosen people are the circumcised. And narrow believers in Christianity sometimes say that the chosen people are the baptized. But the Quran says God's chosen people are all the monotheists from the beginning of the creation. Adam is the first prophet because he falls as in Genesis, but he repents, and God makes him the first prophet. The covenant with the Lord is struck from the very beginning with Adam. And Allah says he has sent messengers at every stage of creation. All of his human creatures are given a message from him. He said, I, I give it in the language that they use. I gave it in Hebrew for the Jewish covenant. I gave it in Greek for the Christian covenant. And I give it in Arabic for the Islamic covenant.
covenant. But they're all my people. Uh, it's an amazingly ecumenical creed. And when we think of the succession of prophets, they're given great praise. Muhammad uh, praises Moses. Uh, in some ways, the most important prophet before Muhammad, though they're all directly from God, it's Jesus. Jesus has given a bigger accreditation than other prophets. John the Baptist is given, made a prophet so that he can prophesy Jesus. Mary, his mother, uh, is the only woman named in the Quran. No wife of Muhammad is named. Uh, there's no Adam and Eve, there's Adam and spouse. Uh, but Mary is not only named, she's made sinless. She conceives uh, Jesus in virgin uh, birth. Uh, she is tremendously honored. So one asks, if this is such an inclusive uh, founding document of the religion, what is it that people object to? It helps, of course, not to read it, then you know what's bad about it. <laughs> but if you do read it, there are things that cause problems for us. There's slavery, there's misogyny, there's militant militarism. But of course, that's true of the Jewish and the Christian covenants, too. Slavery was a kind of universal state in the early stages of Western culture. Uh, the difference, uh, there were slaves in the Old Testament, slaves in the New Testament. Uh, Paul says to his correspondent, Philemon, that the, the slave, Philemon's slave who has worked for him, Onesimus, uh, it would be nice if he were freed. Didn't say you have to, didn't say that's what Christianity means, that you give up slaves. He said, it would be a nice repayment for all, all the good things he's done to me. The difference in the Quran is that though slavery is part of the whole culture, Freeing slaves is something that Allah is especially pleased with. He says, if you want to uh, please me, fast, pray, do pilgrimage, and free a slave. In fact, for certain sins, the penance that he has proscribed is to fast and pray and free a slave. Or if it's a more serious sin, free two slaves. Uh, but freeing slaves is an, an act of virtue, much more than it was in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Well, what about misogyny? It is a misogynist text, as are the Old Testament and the New Testament. They are not uh, modern democracies with equal rights for women. In the seventh century, when Muhammad was writing, uh, there was no non-misogynist culture. But there are, again, certain dif differences. Uh, one of the things that you have to filter everything through when you're talking about women in the Quran is that the Quran believed, like the Old Testament, in polygyny, not polygamy, uh, multiple marriages, not polyandry, multiple husbands, but polygyny, uh, multiple wives. But there are a lot of rules on your multiple wives. There, you shouldn't uh, take a wife unless she consents, she wants to join you, and 
you shouldn't take one if you can't support her in dignity. Uh, that's why, in a general rule, you should not have more than four wives. Now, an exception is made for Muhammad because one of the ways he honored women, especially the widows of his comrades who had been with him in his idra from Mecca to Medina, was to marry them and make her, them very honored in that society. Uh, there usually wasn't any question of consummation of the wedding. It was an honorific. But there was another key difference. We think of dowries in the Western uh, culture as give the father of the bride giving money to the family of the groom. And that's why people were very careful to acquire enough for a dowry for their daughters. Uh, and the way you could get advanced social status is to give a dowry to a superior family in the region. And if you splurged on the first bride, it made it harder to sell a second bride, to marry a second bride, uh, or a third or a fourth. And that's why so many convents in medieval and Renaissance Europe uh, were stuffed with daughters who couldn't be given dowries. It's very different in the Quran. The dowry is paid directly to the bride, and she keeps it. It's her property. Uh, you know, one of the things that is misogynist about the Quran is that in, for certain legal purposes, women only count as half of men. So uh, it says, if you're striking up a, a contract, Mecca was an entrepot of multiple caravans, multiple cultures, etc., and it was an oral culture. So making contracts that would hold were very difficult. There was not normally written contracts. So what the Quran says, if you want to get a contract in this trade center of Mecca, get two men of upstanding reputations to witness. They will say, I stake my reputation on the fact that I witnessed this contract and it's valid. So if you can't get two men of sterling reputation, get a man and two women. They'll add up. Uh, <laughs> that'll be like two men. It also says when you're leaving uh, an inheritance to your heirs, give uh, the man, the son, a full share, and the daughter half of that. So once again, she's only worth half of what a man is worth. But the dowry goes to her. Remember, even if you're only giving a half of the son's inheritance, you're giving it. She, can, she inherits. She's a property owner, which is quite unusual in the world of that day. And it, would, it made uh, people a little hesitant to divorce a woman when you know she's going to take her dowry with her. Uh, and on the other hand, the woman can also leave and take her dowry with her. So you should probably try to stay on her good side. All of this is a very far cry from most of the cultural norms in the seventh century. Well, misogyny is there, but somewhat tempered. How about militarism? Allah says in the Quran that only defensive warfare is just warfare. You can't commit an act of aggression certainly not an act of terrorism. That's nowhere envisaged in the Quran. And how did, you know, people say, well, jihad means holy war. It doesn't. Uh, there was holy war going on, but it's not in the Quran. There's, that concept is not 
anywhere expressed in the Quran. And when people say that jihad is holy war or aggressive war or terrorism, that's just plain wrong. Jihad means roughly what zeal means in our culture. And Allah says, for instance, uh, wage jihad for the Quran. That is, preach the Quran. Uh, spread the good word. And getting self-control is an act of jihad. Now, if you get into a just war, you can consider that you promote that zealously as jihad. How did the holy war come up? Well, the verse that is constantly cited is the so-called sword verse. Uh, the, sword, the word doesn't occur there or anywhere in the Quran. It occurs all over the place in the book of Revelation of the New Testament, but nowhere in the Quran. And the, the episode that is often used is that when Muhammad was driven out of Mecca to Medina, uh, and then his own tribe, the Quraysh, attacked Medina and they were able to fight back. But Mecca was a great pilgrimage center for many years because of the Kaaba, the great cubical temple, holy place. It's still where pilgrims process around when they go there every year. When they were driven out of Mecca, the Kaaba was taken over by pagans by worshippers of various gods. And the, by the way, the only enemy in the Quran is idolaters, that is, pagan believers in different gods. And when people came in in caravans to Mecca uh, and they had driven out Muhammad, they put up idols of their gods in this holy place. It's a holy place that they say had actually been established by Adam's progeny. Uh, then it was wiped out in the deluge, but it was refounded by Abraham. And that's why it's so holy to Abraham's descendants of the Islamic faith. Abraham is, of course, the father of all three faiths. When they went back, Muhammad and his followers, to Mecca, they wanted to strike a truce, like the peace of God in the Middle Ages, in the temple area, and say, no one can kill or fight in this area. And in the sword verse, it says that after four months, you can respond to the people who have attacked you. But after four months, that's the length of the treaty that they had struck. And what they did was ask, while the treaty was in force, what if we are attacked? And they were attacked by the idolaters. And Allah tells Muhammad, you can't fight back in the holy area. You have to observe the truce, even if they don't. But after four months, uh, then you can lie in wait for the ones who had actually attacked you and uh, fight them back. Not their families, not bystanders, not civilians, uh, only the ones who had attacked you. Now, out of that, we get the claim that Islam is fighting a jihad against other faiths, there are no other faiths but uh, idolaters because Allah struck the covenant with the Jewish faith and the Christian faith as well as the Islamic faith. And they're all equally bargains with the same God. As he used one language for people who spoke that language and one name uh, 
he struck the covenant in Hebrew uh, as Yahweh. He struck the covenant in Greek as Abba, the father of Jesus. And he struck the covenant in Islamic with Muhammad. But they're all one God, uh, and he cares for everything uh, in all of those uh, people that he has sent messages to. He boasts that I send messages all the time. I have prophets uh, at every stage of the creation. And he says, not only do I send particular prophets, uh, my whole creation is a prophecy. Not, prophecy, of course, doesn't mean predicting the future. It means spreading the word of God, the, the one God truth of uh, people's origin. So he says, Moses and the mountain were prophesied me. Creation itself, water prophesies me. Uh, and his way of saying that is that everything that I made shows me forth. It proclaims me. Mountains and rivers and trees and plants. He said, notice how plants come back in the desert. That's, that's uh, predicting and prophesying how you will be reserved, uh, re returned from death, that there'll be a resurrection of your body. So I began by citing one creed. There are a number of other creeds. I'd like to finish by mentioning another one. This is Allah speaking. We gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, each of whom we guided, as we guided Noah beforehand. And among his descendants were David, Solomon, Job, Joseph, Moses, Aaron. In this way, we re reward those who do good. Zechariah, John, Jesus, and Elijah, every one of them was righteous. Ishmael, Elisha, Jonah, and Lot. We favored each, one of them over uh, other people and also some of their forebears, their offspring, their brothers. We chose them and used them to guide people on a straight path. Such is God's guidance. With it, he guides whichever of his servants he will. If they had associated other gods with him, all their deeds would have come to nothing. These are the ones to whom we gave the scripture, wisdom, and prophethood. So that's almost all our grades. Thank you. So now it's time for some questions, and there will be a microphone out in the audience. And if we can't hear well enough up here, I'll just translate up on stage. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. As a Catholic and a Christian, I think of the Bible as being very metaphorical um, and, and used a lot of analogies. Would the same be true of the Koran? Uh, as a Christian, I consider Jesus a prophet. But he's a prophet of the one God. There's not several. Uh, so uh, as a Christian, I worship Allah. And in terms, in terms of metaphors in the Quran, how do metaphors play out in the Quran compared to in the Christian Bible? <laughs> well, he has various prophets use metaphors. Uh, Solomon when he's dealing with ants and birds. Uh, I suppose that's metaphorical language. He, he calls the birds together and says, well, where's the hoopoe? And he's not there. And he says, I, I would have wanted him to show up at this conference of the birds. And then the hoopoe comes in and says, I'm sorry, but I, I 
have a new message for you. I was flying over the Queen of Sheba's domain, and she doesn't worship you. She's an idolater. And so uh, Solomon sends the hoopoe back to her and says, well, come and visit uh, Solomon, and he'll straighten you out. Now, I suppose that could be considered metaphorical language. Uh, but it's pretty literal, and it shows in things Things can talk, mountains can talk in the Quran. And when there's a sinner who's being consigned to hell, he says, I didn't do that. And his skin says, oh yes you did, I, I was there. And he says, how can you talk? And he said, the Lord lets whoever he wants to talk, talk. Uh, so there are, elements of what we would consider folk tale in the uh, Quran, as there are in the Bible, uh, whether Old or New Testament. Uh, but as I say, I, I think, you know, if Francis could preach to the birds, I guess the birds can report to Solomon. Hi, I was intrigued by your description of prophecy as being something that's ongoing in the Quran, and I wondered how that, how that relate to the idea of Muhammad as being the seal of the prophets or the final prophet? The seal of the prophets? That means the confirmation that all of the prophets, he's part of their tradition. It doesn't mean they're abolished. Uh, it expressly says in the Quran that uh, my covenant with you does not abolish my covenant with other people. So seal of the prophet doesn't mean he's, that's the end. He means it's the confirmation, the ongoing line of prophets that God says, I always send. Do you see or make any distinction between the uh, uh, Mecca portion and, and the Medina portion of the Quran? Uh, yeah. The Mecca portions, he's not at war with anyone. Uh, when he's driven out of Mecca to Medina, uh, then he is attacked there and respond in the famous battle of the ditch around uh, Medina. And you can respond to an attack. That's just war. So there are more instructions on how to wage just war in the Medina parts than in the Mecca parts. But of course, one of the reasons it's hard to read the Quran is that the chronology is not absolutely clear. People. Uh, guess now and argue now what, what's most likely have uh, been a revelation in Mecca and a revelation in Medina. But uh, Muhammad did not arrange the revelations himself. That was done after he died. Uh, it's like the New Testament, you know. Muhammad and Jesus were both non-writers. They didn't write their own stuff. And when they died, uh, their disciples put together over some time uh, both the New Testament and the Quran. But they, did, they didn't know about what was, by that time, all they had were these disjunct uh, revelations. And they didn't know what came before what. So they, they arranged them in a really non-helpful way, long parts first, short parts second. Uh, so one of the problems with reading the Quran is that you can't see a obvious order in the whole thing. Uh, you have to savor the various parts and see how they fit together. Uh, that makes it more difficult than, but of course, the New Testament is that way too. You know, first you got the letters of Paul, then some Gospels and then some other books like Revelation. Uh, so both of them involve an entry into the world of belief where you take seriously what's being taught about the one God. At the beginning of your talk, you spoke about a survey where 7% in regard to 7-Eleven 
um, agreed with that attack, 23% didn't. What did the other 70% respond? I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't count. <laughs> Why was uh, Islam so uh, advanced or progressive in about, what is it, the 10th or 11th century and seemingly so uh, unprogressive today? Well, Islam, like Christianity, has undergone a long history, some of it not very pleasing. They, what happens with many religions is that they begin as a persecuted minority, and then finally they work their way up to kind of able to address people uh, on somewhat equal terms, and then they get more numerous than the opponents, and they begin to acquire power, and power corrupts. And so the, the imperial stage of Christianity, when it ruled medieval Europe under a pope who was a, a corrupt prince, uh, had some of the same things happen in Islam. During the imperial period of the caliphate, the original, the true caliphate, uh, they were a, an imperial power with all the problems that come with an imperial power, but they were far more tolerant of other religions than Christianity was. Christianity burnt heretics and forced conversions and that kind of thing. During the original caliphate, when they're very good uh, art and other works were accomplished. You could be a Christian or a Jew if you paid a tax. The tax was really for the police power that kept society together that you could live in. Uh, but they had their dark ages. We had our dark ages. They had their enlightenment. We've had our enlightenment. Uh, we've had crusade. Uh, militarism in both religions. Religion is a very dangerous thing. Lucretius said, tantum religio poruit suadere malorum. How suasive is religion to our bane. So the, the history of religious war is the worst kind of history because if you're fighting for God, your enemy is the enemy of God and he's quickly diabolized. You're fighting the devil, and there's no, all bets are off when you're up against the devil. So uh, you can say, as Dawkins and other people say, well, if it's so dangerous, get rid of it. There are a lot of dangerous things that we don't want to get rid of. Sex is dangerous. <laughs> Families are dangerous. Uh, tribal cultures are dangerous. All of those things are also irreplaceable. So the problem is not to get rid of religion, but to control it, to contain it, going back to its original inspiration, which in most cases is God is love and wants you to be loving to him and to others. That's the, uh, Edmund, Edward Gibbon, the great, Enlightenment philosopher said, the, the essence of religion is love of God and love of neighbor, and everything else that gets added is usually pretty contaminated. Hi, could you talk a bit about the different perspectives between the Sunni and Shia versions of Islam? Yeah, Muhammad left no male heir. He had those, all those wives, but no baby that lived who was a male. So his legacy was uncertain after his death. And because there was no direct heir, some people claimed that even a peripheral relation, family relationship is what matters. So there's a, a family descendant. Others said the comrades are what mattered. 
the comrades were the, they're pretty much like the apostles in Christian history. They were with him uh, in his times of trial and they're terrifically honored. And the same is true of their descendants. So Sunni is mainly family and Shia is mainly comrade related. And that, that set up rival interpretations of what Muhammad really meant. And there, there's not a lot of law in the Quran any more than in the New Testament. But as people became more powerful and in situations where they controlled things, uh, you elaborate different rules. So Sharia law, for instance, Sharia occurs only once in the Quran, and that's in a non-legislative passage. Muhammad was rejected by a lot of people, like the prophets of the Jewish faith. And God has to say, well, I don't care if they're rejecting you now. You go ahead and deliver my message. So at one point, uh, Allah is trying to cheer Muhammad up that he's not having the kind of success he thought he should have. And he says, don't worry, you're on the right path, Sharia. And path is a very important concept in a de desert culture because it means the, the path to the oasis. If you, know the, if you know how to get to water, you'll live. If you don't, you won't. Uh, so there are four schools of Sunni Sharia law and three schools of Shia uh, Sharia law. And when, you know, we've had dozens of states in America who said, we're going to stop having this Sharia law. Uh, they don't know what they're saying. <laughs> Which of those seven legislative systems are they saying you can't bring in? And the little bits of Sharia that they think they are outlawing are things like Muslims have their own rules for divorce, marriage, inheritance, etc. And you can have all of those in the legal framework of a modern state. Uh, Christians have their own divorce laws and uh, priesthood laws and other kind of laws which don't conflict with the state law. And so when there's any real Sharia law involved, it's that kind of law, which has not, doesn't mean taking over the whole system of laws of the nation or the state. Uh, it means what people have always meant in America, that Jews have their uh, way of celebrating and marrying and that kind of stuff, and so do Christians. So I think that's the insofar as there's anything rational in the uh, attempts to prevent Sharia law from taking over our state government, it's that. <laughs> um, I wondered if you could back up a bit and give us some chronology of uh, when the Quran became the Quran and when Muhammad became a prophet and when Allah became the God of this group of people. Uh, because the Bible comes after God created the world. So I'd like to know the chronology in terms of the Christian and Judaic world and in terms of its own world, please. Muhammad became a prophet when he had a uh, revelation in a cave uh, and he started dictating to friends or assistants what, what he had heard. He couldn't write it down himself. And it was copied on shards, and this is in the early 7th century, uh, copied on shards and uh, other surfaces. And they, then they started accumulating and were kept until after his death when they put them all together. Uh, so he's the third in chronology. You know, the Jewish 
revelations came all the after uh, before the the AD birth of Jesus, then Jesus in the first century, then Muhammad in the seventh century. But Muhammad, Allah has always been there. That he was preaching over and over and over that it, it didn't start with me, it started with Adam. And Allah is revealing to me what he wants to the uh, Arabic speaking people to do to please him. And that doesn't mean that we, we made up a new religion in the seventh century. Uh, there's only been one religion and one God. As we try and find a bridge, uh, you know, with Islam um, here in the like, Western world, uh, would you say that there is an opportunity um, in perhaps, you know, learning from how they view the natural world with maybe more enchantment or something, um, especially as we like, you know, battle things like you know, climate change and like, whatnot, um, maybe this is something that we could you know, bond together about is how to preserve and how to sustain the natural world. Maybe we could learn from them. That's a question. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the early chapters in my book is called Conversing with the Cosmos, that communicating is the essence of creating in the Quran. And that speaks to a lot of people today who say, we can't destroy God's wonderful creation around us. We have to take care of it and love it. And that's more clear in the Quran because the, the communication talks back to him. Uh, it's saying, don't, don't infringe our existence. Don't, don't endanger our service to you. Uh, God put us here to keep up the conversation. We live in a culture where we believe in separation of church and state. And it's my understanding that Islam feels or believes that the church and the state really must function together. Can you explain, does that come out of the Quran or is that a later development? Uh, no, the, the legislative system that Muhammad instituted was pretty much improvised from crisis to crisis. There's no legislative system in uh, the Gospels either. Jesus didn't set up a state. And when, uh, when Pilate asks him, are you a king of the Jews? He said, my kingdom is not of this earth. And that's pretty much what Muhammad was saying. But of course, almost instantly when they died, uh, they, both Christianity and uh, Judaism also, of course, it, it made the church and state, the theocratic state. We went through a theocratic state as Christians. Uh, in fact, it was as late as the 19th century the Pope finally said, you can have a secular state and a religious populace. He had been denying that all the way through the night, up to and through the 19th century. So putting together later history and the original inspiration is a difficult but necessary task for all of the three peoples of the book, as the Quran calls them, the Abrahamic and Mosaic and Christian and Islamic. One of the things that has been totally agreed on in the larger Muslim community is that the Islamic state, so-called, was not a state and doesn't have any Quranic background. Uh, they are no more authentic than the Christian terrorists who try to upset abortion clinics and that kind of thing. Uh, that you have to be pretty religiously dumb to do that. And uh, 
unfortunately, it's pretty easy to misrepresent Islam because so few have read the Quran. That this book I published is a product of my shame. I was embarrassed. Uh, after 9-11, I was talking with a group of friends, academic friends, and we were wondering, you know, is this really a, an Islamic uh, event, the 9-11 attack? And at some point, people asked, well, who here has read the Quran? None of us have. Uh, and a, a friend of mine said, not even you, Gary? I thought you were a student of religion. And I, and I said, yeah, that's the problem. I'm, I'm totally ashamed. Uh, and so I went and have been trying to repair that stupidity ever since. But I've tried in a lot of venues to ask how many people have read the Quran. Dare I do it now? <laughs> uh, how many have read the Quran? A minority, certainly. <laughs> uh, well, I don't want to shame you, but I do. <laughs> I think we should all be ashamed. You know, we're, we're throwing our weight around in a world where almost a quarter of the population are Muslims. And not to know, you know, how, how can you say the Islamic State is a false construct if you don't know what true Islam is? Following up on your last comments, your, your book is entitled uh, What the Quran Meant. I'm wondering um, if uh, you know how Islamic theologians um, agree with your interpretation. Yeah, most do. Uh, in fact, I've been getting correspondence from many Muslims. I relied in great part on a whole range of scholars, but the study Quran, a, a big five author, 2,000 page up to date book, uh, giving the best of the scholarship that's available now. And I draw, I draw on that heavily, and one of the authors wrote to tell me how pleased he was that we agreed. So I'm not, uh, the past tense in what the Quran meant I also wrote a book called What the Gospels Meant and What Paul Meant. I mean, what did it mean to its original audience? It means all kinds of things later on, some good, some bad, uh, both for Paul and for the Gospels and for the Quran. But uh, if we don't want to get tangled up in the complicated history of various interpretations, uh, we have to go back and try to create, as far as we can, what, were the, what was the vocabulary, the social setting, all of that for the original revelations. And then people can fight out what happened to it later on. But we, if we don't have that for a starting point, we'll just wander in a maze, it seems to me. How does Mohammed in the Quran explain the existence of evil in the world? Uh, humans are not God. They are limited and fallible. And they do horrible things. And that's why when you're sent to hell, your skin's going to tell the truth even if you don't. Uh, <laughs> so. Nobody can really explain evil, uh, but the problem is if God can prevent evil, why doesn't he or she? And the 
answer is always free will. Uh, people are free to love, but free not to love. And if you want freedom, that's a, that's a dangerous game. So I don't think it, it really explains any more than the book of Job does or uh, the letters of Paul do. It's a, it's a horrible event in our lives. And one can only hope that more people will use freedom to do things like read the Quran rather than hate the Muslims. <laughs> <laughs>